appreciate being before you tonight. You know, there was a time of uh, national decline and political turmoil. The people had ceased to have God in their knowledge, but rather took pleasure in every perversion imaginable. There were those contrarians who implored the citizens to return to the nation's founding principles, but the prevailing political party assured the naive population that the country's greatness would continue unabated. After all, the nation was blessed by God, therefore no calamity could befall it. <clears throat> Not only that, but the prevailing political party also tried to suppress all voices of opposition. Other rival nations were shown the riches that this nation had accumulated, and the rivals wanted those riches. The nation was as moribund as a cadaver in the hall waiting its turn at embalming, yet it thought it was alive. The executive branch of the government catered to the whims of its more radical members. Its judicial branch rendered judgments contrary to the clear intent of the foundational doc documents it purported to hold dear. The legislative branch had become radical and was nothing more than a rubber stamp of the executive branch, forgetting the best interests of the people they represent somewhere along the way. They sought to secure its hold on the reins of legislative power by all means possible, <clears throat> whether it be legal, illegal, or extra legal, simply because they had the power to do so after the opposition had been effectively silenced. So are we referring to the government of the United States? Well, not intentionally, but as Mark Twain said, history does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. No, we are talking about Judah, the southern kingdom of Israel. It was the prophetic consequence of actions that had taken place long ago, yet continued in spite of warnings to cease. A prisoner who was sewing up some prisoner garments, I guess they do that sort of thing, and he knew the reasons for his circumstances quite well. When asked by a prison chaplain, what was he doing, sewing? He said, no, reaping. The southern kingdom was about to reap the bitter harvest of what it had sown. It should have known, should have not come as a surprise since they had been warned for many years that destruction awaited the, the unfaithful nation. As is the case with nations that have enjoyed the bountiful blessing of God, but were thankless, it always comes as a shock. The Jews had Jerusalem and the temple. Surely they were sanctified for this reason. How long will God tolerate the immorality, idolatry, and depravity of the, the American Republic? I, know, I do not know, but one must remember the multiples of hundreds of years of God's patience and long suffering while awaiting and pleading for the repentance of Israel with the northern kingdom falling first and the southern kingdom of Judah falling last. Although I do not know the immediate or remote future of the United States, we should all be haunted by the limits to God's patience. He remains of God of justice, and sin must be punished. It is foolish indeed to imagine, as most of the country uh, they do, that God will never intervene in the affairs 
of the United States to judge and call it to account for its wickedness. The Bible and the rhyme of history, according to Mark Twain, argue eloquently to the contrary. God's judgment fell on Judah for the gross sin of, of idolatry. It had been swallowed up by this practice. Although it resisted such evil urges longer than the northern kingdom, it eventually fell victim to its own sins. Thus, we begin with our lesson from the book of Daniel. We read in Daniel, the first chapter, verses 1 and 2, that in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and he bought, brought the articles into the treasury house of his God. Thus the siege of Jerusalem <coughs> began about uh, 605 B.C. <coughs> I think that's right. I, <coughs> I went back and checked some of my old calendars, and that was the date I had down. <coughs> this was the first of three deportations of the Jews. The second came in 597 B.C., and the third and last in 586 B.C., at which time Jerusalem was also destroyed. It was during the first siege that Daniel and his three companions were captured and deported to Babylon. At the time, they were probably in their mid to late teens, somewhere in there. Whatever plans and aspirations they may have had as citizens of Jerusalem ended at such time. Their fate was theirs no longer to control. Or was it? Young men were taken to serve Nebuchadnezzar. The selection criteria set forth in Daniel, first chapter, verses 3 through 7, were high. They were selected from three categories, the children of Israel, the king's descendants, and some of the nobles. Furthermore, they had to be young men, unblemished, good-looking, wise, knowledgeable and intelligent and all I can say to that is I'm glad I wasn't living back in Jerusalem at that time <laughs> I'm children of the Jews you know <laughs> I said I'm children of the Jews so <laughs> children of Israel so <laughs> buddy you you would have been safe back then don't worry <laughs> They also had to be able to learn the language and literature of the Chaldeans. Uh, how many were selected? These young men were the cream de la cream. The account only mentions four by name, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants, and some of the nobles, and young men, in whom there's no blemish, good-looking, good gifted in all wisdom, possessing knowledge. Now, these, these uh, young men were going to serve the kings, so he wanted the very best. And he also wanted them to be trained because they were going to serve before the king. They just couldn't be, uh, there's protocols that they had to, to uh, abide by. And, of course, this selection carried with it certain special favors and privileges, as the Chaldeans viewed it, that is. They were to be given three years of training because uh, serving the king, as I said, followed certain protocols and customs, something a Jew would not uh, know. Further, they were to be given special food and drink that the Chaldeans considered appropriate to the position of a servant of the king. In essence, then, they were to be remade into Chaldeans. Now, with respect to uh, Daniel, 
he was a keen student of the scriptures. As such, he recognized that the food and drink to be given him and the young men violated the dietary laws of the Mosaical system. Therefore, Daniel protested being required to partake in the things that would cause him to be disobedient to the law. And he purposed in his heart that he would not do so. And we can read about that in Daniel, the first chapter, verses 8 through 16. But Daniel purposed in his heart. There, there's some implications of purpose in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacy, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, Daniel had, uh, or God had brought Daniel in favor of the chief of the eunuchs. And he told Daniel, you know, I fear the Lord, I fear the, fear the king, my Lord, who has appointed your food and drink. It was the king that specified that he had to do these things. For why should he see your faces looking worse and the young men who are your age. Therefore, you may endanger my head before the king. So he had, a, he had a legitimate concern. So Daniel said to the steward, please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined. And if the... Uh, parents of the of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacy and you can whatever it is you can deal with it according to what you see so he thought that was a reasonable proposal and he agreed to it he tested him in 10 days and at the end of the 10 days they looked better and fatter than all the other young men so there are more the young men than just those four but don't know who they were and implicit in this passage is that Daniel, at such a young age, and remember he's a teenager, he was a keen student of the scriptures. Not only that, he knew how to apply such scriptures to the problem, problems of daily life, especially daily life in Babylon. He had discernment, that is, he could apply scripture to a particular circumstance and he also had moral courage, conviction. Therefore, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies nor with the wine which he drank. Yet Daniel was polite in his refusal and realizing the impact that it would have on Ashpenaz, he offered a well-reasoned and acceptable solution Please test your servants for 10 days and let them give us vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance be examined for you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies as you see fit, so deal with your servants. This was agreed to as a reasonable request by Melzar, that's the steward that Ashpenaz had set over them, and at the end of the ten days, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who ate the portion of the king's delicacies. Thus, the steward took away their portions of delicacies and the wine that they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Clearly, Daniel had faith that obedience to the word of God would work to their advantage and not to their harm. Daniel had what so many of his countrymen did not have, that is, a knowledge of the Word of God, and therefrom a faith to live by in any environment in which he would find himself. It seems nowadays that higher education results in unfaithfulness, but it does not have to be that way. We read in Daniel the, uh, 17, the first uh, chapter, verse 17 through 21, as for these four young men, God gave them knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. And you can uh, read the rest of that 
These four young men had knowledge and skill in all literature and wisdom. And additionally, Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Now, Nebuchadnezzar examined them in the Chaldean language. You know, he was a king. He didn't have to do it in Hebrew. And he was a highly educated man himself. Being such, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers who were in all his realm. It was as the psalmist said in Psalms, the 119th Psalm, verses 98 through 100, you, through your commandments, made me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. Secular, secular education cannot provide what the scriptures can. Sir Walter Moberly, he's a British educator, he wrote a book in 1949 called The Crisis in the University. <clears throat> and he quoted there, if you want a bomb, the chemist department will teach you how to make, a, make it. If you want a cathedral, the Department of Architecture will teach you how to build it. If you want a healthy body, the Department of Physiology and Medicine will teach you how to tend it. But when you ask whether and why you should want bombs or cathedrals or healthy bodies, the university is dumb and silent. It can help and give guidance in all things subsidiary, but not in the attainment of the one thing that's useful. We read further that uh, Daniel was a man of principle. He refused the great re rewards offered by Belteshazzar for the interpretation of his dream. In Daniel 5th chapter, verse 17, we read, Then Daniel answered, after he had been offered these things, and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and will make known to him the interpretation. Daniel was not swayed by financial gain. Furthermore, we read in uh, Daniel the sixth chapter, verse 10, that Daniel refused to obey the proclamation of Dar Darius that denied anyone from appealing to any god other than himself, Darius. It earned him uh, overnight to stay in the lion's inn. It, says, read, it reads there, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home. That was the writing that you couldn't uh, bow down for any, to any god other than uh, Belshazzar. And in his upper room, with his window open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before is God, as was his custom since early days, since the time he was a teenager, maybe even before. God admires those who will stand by their principles and words, provided such are based on his word. The 15th Psalm, which is a very short one, says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? He who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He who does not backbite with his tongue nor does evil to his neighbor nor does he take up reproach against a fr his friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised. But he honors those who fear the Lord. He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at usury nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things shall never be moved. Daniel distinguished himself above all others at the, in the discharge of his official duties. There was no charge of error or fault when he came to the management of his official responsibilities, such that Darius gave thought to setting him over the whole realm and the other administrators knew that they had to act and act quickly. 
We'll read in Daniel, the sixth chapter, verses one through five. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them, so the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault because he was faithful. He was a man of principle. Nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any charge against this Daniel lest we find it against him concerning the law of his God. The other administrators knew that they could find nothing amiss to charge Daniel with in the discharge of his official duties. They knew they had to find something concerning the law uh, of his God that contravened some edict of Darius. Therefore, in, we read in Daniel the seventh, uh, sixth chapter, verses seven through 10, all the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and satraps, the counselors and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. Now, this did not deter Daniel from his customary time to pray. It goes on to read in verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his window open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since the early days. Likewise, the Christian is admonished to pray, perhaps using Daniel as an example. In 1 Thessalonians, the fifth chapter, verses 17 and 18, it says, Pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. And Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verse 2, can continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. We read in Romans, the 15th chapter, verse uh, 4, for whatever things are written before, were written for our learning that we through patience and the comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Therefore, let us strive to be a Daniel, one who will strive to become a person of purpose, principle, purity, and prayer. That is the answer to a nation in crisis. If you are not a Christian, we want to offer this opportunity for you to become one. You must hear the uh, saving gospel and believe that Jesus Christ is the, uh, the Christ. You need to repent of your sins and confess that the Christ is the Son of God and then be baptized in water for the remission of sins. If you have a need in that regard or you have left your first love and need to repent, we want to offer that opportunity also for you to respond to the gospel's call as we stand and sing. 